بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Surely all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, the sustainer, and the controller of all that happens in the universe. And we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very often in life, we experience events that may bring about difficulties and hardships for us. And Many people, as they are faced with these ups and downs, the more downs in particular, they react in a way that demonstrates displeasure and even annoyance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with God. And this is why it is important, brothers and sisters, for us as Muslims to understand our belief system the aqidah of the Muslim. It is important that we study this subject matter, aqidah, so that we as Muslims and as individuals would know what we are required to believe, what sort of perspectives and understandings we should have about various issues. And if we do, then when we are faced with these dislike circumstances in life, you know, the trials and the calamities we might face, a person would still have peace of mind. A person will still have peace of mind. Because there is no need to blame God Almighty or to get angry or upset with God Almighty. For the simple fact that Allah the Exalted in whatever He does is not unjust to any of His creatures. This is an important point or concept in our aqidah, our belief in Allah and on our, on our understanding of Allah, of God Almighty. That God does not do any injustice. And this is clearly in many ayats in the Qur'an, very clearly established. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah Qaf, He said, وَمَا أَنَا بِظَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدِ And I, that is Allah, am not an oppressor, or someone who deals unjustly with his servants. Plus, if we look at Surah Al-Baqarah, when Prophet Ibrahim السلام, left his family in Mecca to live Hajar and Ismail, this was at the time when there was no flowing water in Mecca. The Zamzam well did not flow yet. He left them there on the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he went away. But when he got to a place, a distance where he could not see his family and they couldn't see him, he turned around and he prayed to Allah to protect them. Among the things he prayed to Allah for, as Allah mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah, towards the end of the first juz, Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي إِجْعَلْ هَذَا بَلَدًا آمِنًا Allah says, remember when Ibrahim prayed and said, My Lord, make this city a city of peace and security, meaning Mecca. Make Mecca a secure place, a safe place. وَرُزُقْ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ And feed its citizens, its people with all kinds of fruits. 
But Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Man amana minhum billahi wal yawmil akhir. But only those of them, O Lord, who believe in Allah in the last day. So he prayed, O Allah, make this city a city that is a secure and safe city and feed its people with all kinds of fruits, but only those who believe in you on the last day. Meaning, those who don't believe, don't feed them, starve them. But look at the answer and the reply and the response from Allah, the Creator, God Almighty. And in this ayah, subhanAllah, we learn a lot about the inner workings of the human mind as opposed to how God Almighty works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Ibrahim, his prophet, قَالَ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَأُمَتِّعُهُ قَلِيلًا Allah says, and even those who disbelieve, I will give them respite for a while. I will also feed them, in other words. Even those who disbelieve. ثُمَّ أَطَّرُّهُ إِلَىٰ عَذَابِ النَّارِ and then after that, I will drive them to the, to the, the punishment of the fire. وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ And that is the worst destination anyone can arrive at, the hellfire. But the point is, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unjust to His servants. Even if the person is not a believer, if Allah were to withhold His sustenance from the disbelievers, in you know, our perspective, it might seem justified. But it would be injustice for God Almighty to do that. Because when He created every creature, He took it upon Himself to provide the rizq for that creature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it upon Himself to do that. He did not leave it up to any creation to provide sustenance for any other creation. He, the Creator Himself and the Sustainer, decided that He would do that. And I'm just mentioning this, brothers and sisters, to show that Allah the Exalted does not do any injustice to anyone. So as Muslims, we must be firm in this belief that despite whatever trials and calamities may come our way in life, it is not because God is unjust, subhanAllah. And so we should not get angry with God and upset with God and begin to, to rebel against God Almighty, to show displeasure. You know, brothers and sisters, some people, when they are faced with hardships, and they pray and they try to get out of it, but some time pass and they still are in the hardship, they lose hope. They say, well, you know, I have prayed and prayed and I have not received any relief from God. I'm going to stop praying. It's, it's wasting my time. No, we cannot. It, in fact, even if we get upset with God, what can, it, what can we possibly do to God? Even if a person were to get angry to the point where he or she decides, you know what, that's it. I'm not praying anymore, period. And everything that God commands to do, I'm not doing anything, any of those. Even if a person were to rebel to that point, it would still not harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Allah does not need anything from any creation in order to exist. We, the creations, we need God. He doesn't need us. So the good we do and the bad we do, neither harm nor benefit Him they harm or benefit ourselves. And this is, this is the message that Allah has consistently reminded us of in the Quran. In Ahsantum, Ahsantum li anfusikum, Surah Al Isra. If you do well, if you do good, in Ahsantum, Ahsantum li anfusikum. You're doing well for yourself, not for God. You can't benefit Him. And if you do evil or you do bad, it's for you as well or against you. So even if a person were to go to the point where they get really angry and decide, I'm not going to obey God anymore, it still doesn't do anything to hurt God or harm Him. It only hurts the individual. 
It only hurts the individual. And this, so this is an important concept in our belief that we need to fully understand in order to ensure that our attitude is always one of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know generally there are people who when things are going good with them, they're happy and they're willing, mashallah, to be God-fearing. Of course, there are those when they're happy, they forget God. And when they're in hardships, then they remember God. And then there are those who when they're happy and things are easy, they remember God. And then when they're faced with hardships, they get upset with God and they want to stop uh, worshipping Him. So when uh, most people are happy, it's easy to still, you know, worship God and so on. But the real test comes when we're faced with hardships. And the first rule that we must be cognizant of is that God is not unjust to anyone. So the hardships we face is not a result of injustice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is a test from Allah to us. And Allah has foretold us this, He has forewarned us that we're going to be tested in life. And the testing will come in various ways. The individual is the one who demonstrates whether or not he or she submits and surrenders to Allah by accepting what Allah has decreed while at the same time praying to Allah for a way out and for ease. That is one reaction. Or the other reaction is to get upset and, get, and to get angry and to now display rebellion and displeasure at what Allah has decreed. And this is precisely why, brothers and sisters, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at the revelations He sent before, including the Qur'an, and if you look at the messages He gave to all the prophets, the first thing that a prophet, when he or she is commissioned, by Allah as a prophet or messenger, the first thing the prophet is ordered to do is to inform his people of the, the correct perception and understanding of God. When Allah began the revelation of the Quran, for the 13 years that the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, Allah did not order the Muslims to pray till the end of, you know, very close to the Hijrah. Fasting was made compulsory in the second year after the Hijrah. Hajj was performed for the very first time by the Muslims in the ninth year of the Hijrah. So all these ibadat were not revealed except after the Hijrah. In Mecca, during the Meccan phase of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the revelation concentrated mainly on the issue of who God is. It hammered home the correct perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is absolutely vital because everything else that is required from the individual is based upon the correct perception and understanding of God. True submission, brothers and sisters, can only come if a person has the correct understanding of God Almighty, the correct perspective. Or else a person will sometimes do things and at other times they will have reservations. People will pick and choose what they want to practice and what they don't want to practice. But when the understanding of God Almighty is sound, then no command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about feelings of reservations or rebellion in the heart and in the mind of the individual. Submission comes just like that. It comes just like that. We have talked before about the prohibition of alcohol, the final prohibition of alcohol. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally prohibited alcohol completely, there were companions in Medina at the time who had gathered together friends just like we do on the weekends, and you know, we do barbecue and things like that. 
companions had gathered. As Al Imam Bukhari tells us in his uh, Sahih about a, an incident, and Anas radiallahu anhu who narrated this hadith, he said he was there as well and he was serving, he was the younger person, so he was serving the rest of the companions who were there alcohol because it wasn't made completely forbidden up to that point in time. And while they were in the middle of this, another companion passed by and he said to them, I am coming from the Messenger of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the complete prohibition of alcohol. And these companions, remember, these are people who are accustomed to drinking alcohol. It's part of their life. Something that they enjoy doing. Yet, when they heard the statement from this companion, they had absolutely no hesitations in stopping immediately. They did not even take, brothers and sisters, the last and final sip of their lives. SubhanAllah. They poured everything out. According to some uh, 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 of the narrations, the streets of Medina were flowing with wine on that day. Because as people heard about this revelation, Im immediately they reacted. They threw it out. And the question that we should consider and look at is, what would make people do this? How could people do this? Imagine something you're doing for so many years. You enjoy doing it. And you hear about that information, not from the Prophet himself, alayhi salam. If you have heard it directly from the Prophet, alayhi salam, maybe then you can say, look, I have no choice. I'm hearing it directly from the Messenger of Allah. But you're hearing it from somebody else. One man. The companions did not say, well, you know, let's wait till we verify this with the Prophet, alayhi salam. No, subhanAllah. It brought about immediate implementation from them. What made this possible? It was the sound belief and understanding they had of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for 13 years before the hijrah, the, the revelation concentrated mainly on hammering home this concept of the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that finally, when all the other obligations were revealed, the people had no reservations at all, submitting and accepting and implementing them. That's how important our belief is. Because it determines now what we will do as Muslims, how much we will live and practice as Muslims. Our belief will determine that. Because our belief, brothers and sisters, our belief makes us who we are. And every human being has some kind of belief whether it is good or bad, or there are are flaws in their belief. But whatever belief a person has, their lives are regulated by that belief. And so we should take it upon ourselves to either do our own personal research by reading or attending a class on this issue whereby we can study the details of the aqidah of Islam. Because this affects everything else that we do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. There is a reason why I'm saying this, but inshallah we're out of time. Uh, on Wednesday we'll discuss, because uh, recently a sister asked me a particular question that made me realize the importance for us as Muslims to really know our aqidah, our belief system. So inshallah we'll deal with that on Wednesday. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open up our hearts and our minds so that we can understand this wonderful message he has revealed for all of mankind and may he motivate us to live by this message may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to to have the correct and the clear understanding and perception of who he is as God and creator and may he keep us from the straight path and forgive for us our mistakes and protect us from the deviations of shaitan aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Thank you.